All right, it's 10 o'clock. I'm going to go ahead, get, go ahead and get started in respect for everybody's time. Um, welcome, everyone. My uh, name is Marianne Iverson, and I'm the Director of Teens and Adult Services at the Down Syndrome Connection. Happy World Down Syndrome Day. Um, great day to celebrate. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank the National Down Syndrome Society for connecting me with Dr. Uh, Marianne to, in order to provide this webinar. Um, it's something we've been wanting to do for a long time, so we're grateful for them. Um, we're thrilled to have so many people from across the state of California joining us. As I said earlier, we had um, 500 registrants, and I have several people on a list that I'm sending the recording to because they couldn't register because so we had a max capacity. So, yay! Um, we're hoping to have enough time at the end of the webinar to um, deal with some questions and answers. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A versus the chat, just so I have one spot to be looking at. Um, you also might be able to like a question if it's similar to yours. That kind of brings it up to the top, and then we can at least make sure we're um, approaching those that have the similar questions, if you will. So um, appreciate that. And um, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Um, but then um, if we can't get to all of them, um, hopefully we can get back with you some of those answers uh, at a later date. So without further ado, um, I would like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Julie Moran. Thank you. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Marianne. And uh, thanks very much for the introduction um, and for the invitation to come and speak with you. I'm gratified to know that um, there's been so much interest um, in this topic. It's something that's a, a passion of mine and, and definitely um, a very um, sort of needed uh, room for education in this field. So I'm very happy to share that with you. Um, I will maybe just briefly introduce myself too, just to let you know who I am, what I do, and then we'll just get right down to it since um, it's funny, I remember being in medical school and being assigned a talk sometimes and they would say like, it's a 15, can you do a 15 minute presentation on X or Y and I would be so nervous at the concept of filling 15 minutes and now when I'm told I have an hour to talk about a topic I'm like oh my goodness I hope I'm able to get it all in. Um, so I'm, I chose for you a topic that is really kind of a scoping overview of um, thinking about aging adults with Down syndrome and thinking about um, the variety of learners that are on this call today and thinking about um, pre presenting uh, concepts and topics that will be hopefully something that's accessible to, to everybody in whatever domain that you work in and whichever way that you serve. Um, individuals with Down syndrome, hopefully this will provide some framework of understanding that um, hopefully will add to your learning around thinking about aging and growing older with Down syndrome. I'm Julie Moran. I'm an internist and geriatrician. My specialty is older adults with intellectual disability. Um, the, my job is I'm in the state of Massachusetts and I work for a state public health hospital where I am the attending physician of a uh, inpatient unit for adults with intellectual disability. And then I also, um, which is basically like an LTAC, it's a rehab um, where we do a whole variety of, um, of work. And then my other role is as a statewide consultant for um, the State Department of Developmental Services in Massachusetts, where I do an outpatient consultation clinic for adults with all forms of intellectual disability and questions related to growing older. Um, and this is a, a specialty within the field of geriatrics that I found my way to in my training um, over the years and years ago, um, and now has become my um, sort of full-time specialty and a topic I enjoy very much sharing with other people. Um, so I will move forward. Um, so this is really just the, um, getting ourselves grounded about why we're even getting together to have this conversation and why this still feels like something novel. And it's certainly not news to anyone that we are just as a population growing older. Um, this is a slide that has been shown in various forms, certainly all the way back to my geriatric training days that we've been shown that indeed the population is growing older. There's, it's the largest segment of the population is the older population, 65 and older and above. Um, that this is, and, and this is often brought up in terms of what's happening with preparedness for aging, and then certainly always the, the constant discussion around how um, certainly um, 
geriatricians and people who specialize in taking care of older patients are far, far, far outmatched by the number of people who would be well suited to utilize their services. And so I put this slide up. This is the general population with um, census data projecting into the future about where the population will be growing in terms of 65 plus. Um, I don't have a, a, a companion slide that would um, highlight adults with intellectual disabilities specifically because that's demographics that's still kind of hard to pin down sometimes, but only just I show this slide only just to show that or to say um, that the trends in people with intellectual disabilities sort of mimic this pattern that we're definitely seeing growth in an aging population um, uh, that is kind of steadily increasing in a similar way. Yes. And indeed, within the past 100 years, this remains a phenomenon that still feels uh, relatively new um, in terms of our experience. So just as a way of kind of validating how quickly things have moved forward, for adults with all forms of intellectual disability in the 1930s, the average life expectancy was 19 years of age. And for adults with Down syndrome, who we are specifically talking about today, um, 100 years ago, the average life expectancy was age nine. Um, so compare now to the to how the adults with intellectual disability of all forms um, are now steadily increasing towards um, a more typical uh, life expectancy. And then still quoted in the general literature is really about 60 years being the average life expectancy for adults with Down syndrome. But certainly being above 60 um, is, is still notable, but is definitely becoming far more common. Um, definitely see, I granted my population is selects for people who are older. So I, I tend to see um, more commonly see people in their 60s, but it is definitely a much more routine thing that people will live into their 60s with Down syndrome. So that again calls to mind, you know, how we're sitting, um, getting educated on a real lifespan's worth of issues um, and moving forward, really thinking more about how to proactively plan for an increasingly aging population. So I'll speak just in terms of my own lived experience in the Massachusetts Department of Developmental Services population. This is indeed seen here in our state in terms of the population you can see just as data that's getting old at this point, it's close to 10 years old, but this was shared with me about how our population is served statewide and the numbers of people. So, you know, looking at the, even on the right-hand side of your screen, looking at the numbers of people in their 60, 65, 75, 85, um, definitely big growth in those areas in terms of making up a large portion of the population that's served in our state. And when we look at, this is actually data that I accessed this morning, just going back to make sure that my slides are nicely updated. There is a I don't know if anyone on the call has used this. Um, I'm sure somebody has, has looked at the um, website called the State of the States in Intellectual Disability, but it has great pooled data um, in, in terms of compiling um, different services and different trends state by state and then um, nationwide for how, how individuals with intellectual disability are served. So when we think about the growth of an aging population, and then we think about where care is evolving for these individuals and where they do live, you can see here that statewide, or I'm sorry, nationwide in the United States, the large majority of individuals um, with intellectual disability live with a family caregiver. Um, and then if we look further down below, in terms of the breakdown of the, the age of the caregiver with whom the individual will live, we see that there's a quarter of the, of the population across the country are living with a caregiver who themselves are dealing with their own aging issues. So are, are going to be aging into this caregiving role as well. So when I think about what captured my attention in a lot of different ways as a geriatrician looking to um, grow more and more into the field of intellectual disability, this is definitely one of those caregiving um, scenarios that felt familiar, very familiar to me as somebody who um, in my traditional geriatrics training was learning how to take care of older neurotypical adults. So people who were aging into their um, 70s, 80s and beyond, but then thinking about the specific needs of those individuals, particularly if they are caregivers then of a adult um, son or daughter who is also living at home under their care and what their needs might be aging in tandem with one another um, is particularly interesting. Um, when I think about these trends nationwide, I thought about cross-referencing it for myself in terms of just 
checking it out with the data that we know in terms of Massachusetts where I practice. And I'll zoom ahead just to say that I know that you are in California, everybody who's joining. And these graphs are actually quite similar. They sort of track it between Massachusetts and California is quite similar and sort of tracks with some of the nationwide data as well. This is, um, here, I'll go back to that. This is the California readout actually in terms of percentage of individuals with intellectual disability by living arrangement. One important thing I should mention about this, um, about this uh, resource is that this pooled data actually includes children. So if this feels like it's overrepresented in terms of what you might have expected for living at home with a family caregiver, um, note that this data does include um, people with intellectual disabilities, not just specifically adults. So that does definitely inflate the family caregiver number, um, but fair enough to say, in fact, I'll go back a slide, um, that when I think about Massachusetts data, this is individuals served by DDS in my state, and these are just adults because um, this is a, an adult service organization for um, people with intellectual disability in our state. And it's about 50% of those individuals live in what's considered their own home. So with a family caregiver. Um, so again, I think the general point being that when we think about aging issues in general, we are thinking about definitely how that impacts the aging individual with intellectual disability, the aging individual with Down syndrome, but absolutely need to also be thinking about the aging caregiving needs, the, the adults who are serving and caring for the family members and um, what that means in terms of an extended lifespan, which is all wonderful, but thinking about that extended lifespan and the role of caregiving into old age um, and what the implications are for that. Not only once we exceed what maybe family can provide or if we hit a point where family caregiving is no longer possible, um, what, how are we moving on to other options um, to serve individuals in community? And in general, I would say over time, definitely within the span of my career in this field, we have definitely seen some increased public awareness of just the general concepts of aging with intellectual disability. And I say that just even meaning that in lay publications, you will start to see some topics that at least you know is kind of stimulating public consciousness about even being aware like, oh, there are adults out there who are aging, who are um, who have intellectual disability and are being served in a variety of settings. Now, some of those um, public awareness has come, like say for example, um, the COVID pandemic and, and what brought to the forefront in terms of how adults with intellectual disability living in group homes or adults with Down syndrome who were felt to be particularly vulnerable to the effects of COVID-19, that definitely kept topics related to um, adults and older adults with intellectual disability kind of alive in the conversation, at least in terms of highlighting um, the existence and presence of people in community in a variety of these types of cohorted settings. Um, there's also these other two topics, um, these other two New York Times um, articles were from last year, but really excellent one, they're not related to Down syndrome, but you just think about in terms of, I think about the average reader just taking in and thinking about for a moment about, um, this actually was really wonderful, this New York Times op doc that you see there, it's about um, uh, a young man with a uh, physical disability and, you know, the ways in which he, he gives his firsthand account of the ways in which he's still sort of infantilized as an adult out in the world. Um, and then the other is about a young woman who is, um, has uh, autism spectrum disorder and some behavioral issues that, um, and just talking about the family and kind of dealing with that as she grows older and planning or growing into, she's, I think, still a teenager in this picture, but growing into adulthood and how they're preparing for that. And then, of course, Crip Camp, which I think um, I imagine many people on this call might be familiar with, but um, you know, got a lot of prominent um, advertisement through Netflix, and um, I think was pretty widely consumed. So, I say this only to say that I see a lot more discussion out in the world, not just within my own niche, my chosen niche of talking about adults and older adults with intellectual disability, but just see different ways that it's kind of percolating out into newspapers and other. Um, media sources to hopefully keep it alive um, as an idea for people. Um, the other uh, publications in lay publications is the um, work that uh, we've put forward with the National Down Syndrome Society. So this is also some guidebooks that um, this, these two that I'm showing you the, the cover shots of right now 
are updated. The Aging and Down Syndrome Guidebook is a book that I actually started, I helped write um, back in 2013, and that was the first version of it that came out. And then this is the updated version that was um, newly revised and edited and is now out this year. Um, I'm not, I don't think it's yet live on their website yet, but it, this is in the final processes of being put out for, for publication and download. And the other is the End of Life and Down Syndrome Guidebook as well. So I bring this up now in this conversation, not only the highlight that this is something that's out there, um, but also one of the things just even at face value that I'm really happy and proud about with these publications is that it is, um, it is something available in the lay press that really shows, um, it highlights obviously issues about older adults and older adults with Down syndrome at all. that you, know, you commonly see around for um, publications around people with Down syndrome is might still you know, show young people or um, so what I really like even just um, as, a, as a, you know, a piece of work is just showing these like really nice um, high definition pictures of an older person with Down syndrome. So I hope that this is a resource that um, the folks on the call are aware of and take advantage of and definitely point um, their uh, family members and other consumers towards these resources online. And then of course the third book, um, which is uh, probably the densest book that I helped write um, for probably understandable purposes, but um, is really about the Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome. We're going to touch on this today. We'll do more than touch on this, but again, it's a large topic and there's always so much that um, is just important for people to really know and understand. So that's part of the reason why this book is a little bit um, dense, um, but I hope that it's it's written in a way that is hopefully um, supposed to be very practical and usable so that people really understand the rationale of um, what the specific worries are um, and concerns around um, the risk for Alzheimer's disease in adults with Down syndrome. And then I'm trying to give some uh, thoughts both proactively and then um, at, at the time that you'd actually be actively concerned to really help navigate through that process. So how well prepared is the medical community? Speaking as somebody um, in the medical community, how well prepared are we for caring for adults, older adults with intellectual disability? In some ways, this is um, probably a rhetorical question. This is um, obviously, uh, there's lots and lots of room to go with this. Um, I'd say within the, my own field and my own experience, there's, um, there's not a humongous number of specialists within this field, but definitely within the field of specialists, it is a very passionate group of people um, and uh, doing a lot of really wonderful work. And I think the, the goal is really to try to disseminate as much education and information as possible so that it's not just within the realm of specialists to take care of individuals experience with caring for adults of all kinds, um, everybody with intellectual disability who is on their panel. Um, but I can say for myself that at least in medical training, for me, this is still very much where the topic of intellectual disability might begin and end is really at still topics of uh, early childhood development, um, genetics, human development, um, you know, talking about, or pediatrics. So talking about the young child who's born with Down syndrome, how you counsel somebody with their genetic testing, how you disclose a diagnosis, how you counsel somebody who's pregnant. Um, but I know for myself, and this is still borne out in a lot of the medical education literature, for myself, my own experience was that there was, oops, excuse me, the rest of the story was just never filled in, that the you know, adorable young boy with Down syndrome grows up to be a young man with, um, you know, a whole rich and full life who then ages into later adulthood and old age. And I think this lifespan perspective is something that I'm always interested in trying to promote and share more with all the different learners who come to learn with me and then certainly to highlight to my geriatrics colleagues um, in terms of the, the ways in which geriatric training is very well suited to caring for adults with intellectual, intellectual disability as they grow older. 
Um, but to su suffice to say that the um, this kind of lifespan perspective and understanding the the whole lifespan needs of adults with intellectual disability, there's definitely some um, room for improvement in terms of highlighting that or including that in medical curriculum and also all levels of healthcare training. So I'll pivot here to talk about, uh, we'll move on to talking about sort of the, the rest of the concepts um, in our conversation, but it gets me back to talking about this idea of change. Um, when I was talking to Marianne about this talk and thinking about the amount of time we had and the kind of variety of learners, this is really a topic that I like to introduce and sort of think of, have everybody who is listening and learning from this try to kind of think about this concept um, as opposed to worrying too much about um, medical details or, or kind of having this be too much of a sort of a healthcare or medical talk, but really just thinking about big picture concepts of change as a way into having this um, other discussion around growing older. Um, so I think about change also in the amount of time that I've been a geriatrician and uh, geriatrics is an interesting field because it is a um, I think sometimes there, there would be some active discussions amongst geriatricians about what exactly we are specialists of. Um, since geriatricians don't have a, an organ system, we're not you know, kidney doctors or lung doctors, we are doctors of older patients would be kind of the quick way I would explain what that actually means if I was just having a brief conversation with somebody I sat next to on a plane or something and I just wanted to explain what that was. But honestly, in the field of geriatrics, you do wonder what, it's not really just chronological age. It's not just that if you were, your year of birth is X or lower then you are appropriate to see a, a specialist. And I think those of you on the call can probably appreciate that concept that you know people who are aging successfully and well, who right now as we're having this conversation are on their, um, you know, out doing 18 holes of golf right now or something, and they're, you know, um, in retirement age and doing fantastic. And then there's people who are in their, you know, maybe early 50s who are, um, have lots of medical complexity and would actually probably be well suited to somebody who um, has specialty training in, you know, all the different sort of multimorbidities of growing older. So again, when we think about geriatrics, you know, that whole debate, what is the concepts? And I had thought that what became clear to me, particularly in doing this work, is that aging at its most elemental is really all about change. You know, change as change in memory, change in function, really change over as a function of time. That as time has gone on, certain things either we've, you know, lost certain skills or certain things have gotten a little bit more challenging. Um, a lot of the framework of the different things that geriatricians are trained to deal with is really about evaluating and understanding and, and helping identify what the core drivers are that might be um, contributing to change. So when we think about change, I think about basically that when people come to see me for questions related to growing older, the chief complaint, like the main thing they're coming to complain of is, I can really basically replace it with these two words. Something's different. Something is looking different for me. Um, it, it could be that they are concerned about memory or they're concerned about function or they're concerned about a change in behavior. But in terms of just hearing the most elemental complaint, it's really that something's starting to look different and they're concerned. And I actually find it helpful to boil it down to that very basic statement of need because then it doesn't blind or bias me towards saying like, I'm doing a memory evaluation or I'm looking just at their gait abnormality, but I'm just, I'm responding to the fact that the people who are coming to see me are saying something's different, something that you're, you know, you're seeing this person for the first time, but this is not right. Or in the words of my patient, I need help. <laughs> this is something that um, a adult patient of mine had written down uh, to his mom as a single three word message. Um, but I, I keep it because it just is, um, it's just such like an elemental statement of need. It's exactly what we're trying to communicate at this point. And it really is most helpful to just start from this standing point where I need help, something's different. Um, it's just helpful to start from the most basic building blocks of what's going on with somebody. So some change, when we think about change, we can say that absolutely some changes are sudden. So usually when I 
think about this, you know, I can use the example of, you know, like a catastrophic stroke that, that when that happens to somebody change happens immediately, right? That lots of things are different. Um, I also will say probably a more, um, a certainly more universal change that pretty much everybody experienced is COVID. The onset of, of the pandemic was for many people experienced like literally overnight, you know, sometime in March of 2020, the whole world felt different. So those changes are really sudden in terms of what's the underpinning of what's going on. But generally speaking, when we're talking about at an individual level, most change is not sudden. Just like how, you know, when we are serving children, we are thinking about change is really more in a positive direction, that there's growth and progress and learning. In aging, any of the other changes that we're noticing usually take time. Um, they've kind of been evolving over a period of time or they've kind of been smoldering under the surface and then it takes a little bit of time to capture our attention. So I bring that up to say that when we're talking about change, a lot of times we're kind of unpacking something that's taken a little bit of while to, to show up for somebody. Or it, you know, it's something that we're thinking about, how do we tell the story of what's gone on with this individual? Um, so those are the two, the, the change concept and then storytelling is another concept that I really like. And um, because a lot of times when we're talking about change, it really is like we're trying to tell a story of what might have happened to somebody. And it's honestly one of the most gratifying things that I enjoy about geriatrics is that we are kind of have an opportunity to do some storytelling for somebody who is decades and decades into life. In fact, sometimes in my in my general geriatric days, when I would meet an individual for the first time and I, they were my new patient, but they were 91 years old. Um, and I would almost say this to kind of highlight in some ways the absurdity of it. I would say, I'm only, I'm just trying to make up for the 91 years I missed out of. Because if I had a one hour to get to know them, it was sort of a way of saying like, how do you get caught up and sort of hear the story of an individual so that you can be helpful and present with them present day um, so that you're able to understand how to be helpful to them now. So geriatrics and storytelling really go hand in hand, um, but you have to have a way of getting the story started. So here would be a case that would be very common and typical. Um, a 53 year old man with Down syndrome named Paul is brought to my clinic for a memory evaluation. His recent concerns that have been raised by his group home staff is that Paul appears confused when asked to set the table. He puts his clean laundry away in all the wrong places in his room, and he cannot recall what he did at day program after he comes home. So the question for me is, does Paul have dementia? Um, if we were a smaller group, I would, I would hear your input right now, but um, I'll just say that um, the answer, of course, is not an immediate yes or no. It's a, who knows, maybe we need to talk about it. Something's different. Something is looking different for this individual. Um, they're basically, the, the group home staff is highlighting some stuff where it, an individual is looking confused. Um, but this definitely is very clearly what I would sort of scrub clean as the chief complaint to just say, something's looking different with Paul. I'm meeting him for the first time and we need to figure this out. So this is a, a dense title, but the heterogeneity of adults with intellectual disability and the importance of baseline. And that basically is just saying um, that every individual, every individual on earth is different. But when we think about ways in which um, one of the really key concepts of being able to understand change for individuals with intellectual disability and individuals with Down syndrome is really thinking about having a good understanding of somebody's baseline, what they've been able to do well throughout their entire lifetime. Um, when we think about, this is a, um, this is a slide, it's, it's an old uh, schematic, but I just bring it up to share that um, ways in which sometimes human development and growth over lifespan is, is graphically depicted as this kind of clean sort of um, birth and then growth and development. And then we just plateau throughout adulthood. And then we kind of have this senescent period where we maybe lose function and then ultimately the timeline ends with death. Um, but in terms of thinking about what actually happens for people as they age into adulthood and then have an experience of growing older, a lot of times the experience can be quite a bit more rocky. 
um, or some individuals might not really ever have like a totally perfect plateau of a baseline where everything's in steady state all the time. So I think the, the main point of understanding this is, you know, this might be the time when an individual comes to see me for the very first time. They're down the X axis on their timeline in terms of their chronologic age and things are already starting to look different. And so I, my job is to go back and understand what they've been like throughout their whole lifetime so that I in present day can actually be helpful and impactful in being able to understand what might be going on. Um, so, and the geriatric assessment is really the common, uh, change is really the common theme for all aspects of a geriatric assessment, whether we're looking at memory or function, behavior, mood, or just overall well-being, you know, that somebody's health in general or their overall well-being has started to look altered or different or worsened. We're always looking for what are the key contributing factors to that, and then always endeavoring to find what might be modifiable, improvable, or treatable. And when we're assessing change over time, um, the concept that I always tell people when they're coming to see me for the first time is that if I'm meeting you right now and you are a 62-year-old man with Down syndrome and you come with a team who says, you know, something's different, or at least that's what I'm boiling down the chief complaint to be is that something's different. What I always say back to them is that if I'm meeting you for the first time and something's already different, then we're meeting each other at point B. I need to go back and understand what point A is so that I can fill in the gaps here in terms of what were the contributors that took you from who you were throughout your lifetime at your very best to as we meet each other now. And the, it really is the only way to be able to come up with um, some actual meaningful feedback about what might be going on for an individual. And I'd say that's especially to make assumptions about what an individual's baseline was. And that, you know, say for instance, in the example of Paul, um, the things that his team was highlighting in terms of the fact that he looked, he put the laundry away in the wrong places, or um, he wasn't able to report what he was, what he did earlier that day. The thing that should really capture your attention would be if he clearly had been able to do that throughout his whole lifetime. Um, if he was never somebody who had the skill set to be able to put his laundry away, then that report from his group home staff might not have as much weight or alarm around it. But if he's somebody who was previously incredibly independent, and then that's what they're observing, that's definitely what you're acting upon. So when we're evaluating change for adults with intellectual disability, history is really the, the primary way into that discussion. And that's kind of what I love about the whole uh, storytelling nature of geriatrics too, is that it's not, there's a lot of things that still lend itself completely to just human connection and conversation. It's not about, well, let me draw this blood test and send it off to whatever specialty lab and it'll give us an answer. It's really about, we together can come down with some um, really practical information and take a good history and understand what might be going on. Of course, there's challenges to the history taking. Um, some of it does depend on who the historian is. So we really, for, for evaluating adults with intellectual disability, adults with Down syndrome, it's really important to make sure that somebody is able to at least be the, um, the guardian of the information from the past, or at least somebody who's able to be a spokesperson about what an individual has been able to do well throughout lifetime, or have access at least to some sort of documentation that could help with that. Um, if there's somebody who uh, is not in a caregiving setting with family, but they instead have staff, if there's a high staff turnover and the person who's only known them the longest is a staff member who was hired, you know, a year and a half ago, then there's just definitely some more work that needs to be done to be able to find out what an individual was really capable of back in their 30s or 40s. Um, medical record keeping can be really inconsistent about uh, abilities. I still get, which is very exciting for me because I just love this, but like I'll still get things that are like written on typewriter paper from, you know, the late 1950s or something that will give the information on an individual back when they were you know, six, um, and that will help provide some framework, but there is a lot of detective work that ends up being done because some of that stuff from years ago is just not readily available. So in terms of understanding a baseline history, this is really us 
me asking them, tell me the story of who you were. So basically when I have a conversation with somebody and they there is an interest in, in talking about what is different for somebody with um, Down syndrome or anybody with intellectual disability, I really say I need to understand what things had been um, typical for you throughout lifetime. And because uh, a lot of people sometimes want to kind of zig and zag all over the place, I go through a really structured way of asking this history so that I can understand and get a sort of a mental picture of who somebody was at their very best before we move on and talk about what was what's going on now. Sometimes people have the urge immediately to say, you know, well, he used to be able to do this, but he can't do that now. And I'll always say to me, I just it's so helpful to have a mental picture of what that individual was capable of doing. And then we go ahead and we talk more about the ways in which we might be struggling or what might be looking different. So when we talk about baseline history, that's really talking about from the very basics, an individual's ability to take care of their own body, to perform self-care skills, um, their academic achievements, whether or not they did any employment, their ability for household chores, talents, hobbies, other abilities. So um, any kind of description around what the patient, what the individual's abilities have been like throughout their lifetime. We also talk about memory skills, um, and I'll guide people through that, that discussion um, because there's always some aspect that we can be understanding for somebody's baseline memory ability. So I'll ask about, you know, throughout lifetime, did the individual have an awareness of day and date? Like, was it something that we would wake up and be aware of day and date? Would we have an awareness of a daily schedule, a weekly schedule, a typical daily routine? Would the individual just sort of follow along a typical, wake up on a Tuesday morning and kind of know the hum of a daily routine without being prompted and coached to get through that? Um, did we have ability to understand um, upcoming appointments, upcoming holidays, recurring events, names of people, faces, um, navigation skills in familiar areas, knowing where things go away, um, recognizing landmarks in the community. And then definitely I wanna know at baseline was the individual somebody who had any form of short-term memory skills. So if they were able to come home at the end of a, a trip and talk accurately about what happened yesterday, or if there was something that was coming up tomorrow, would that be something the individual would have an awareness of? Um, if we told somebody that, you know, you're going to have, a, I'm picking you up early on Friday, you're going to have a haircut. Would that be something that we would have an awareness of once Friday came? We talk also about baseline behaviors. So things that would be typical for that individual. Tell me a little bit more about, you know, how would they tend to interact with other people? Were they ever self-injurious? Would they um, act out or be aggressive? And then it's also an important time to understand whether or not there's um, behavioral sort of quirks. Um, so uh, especially common for people with Down syndrome would be anything where we in, um, would engage in like self-dialogue, um, self-talk in our room or have imaginary friends. Um, just hearing a little bit more about that and understanding, you know, how typical that would be for an individual in terms of processing feelings. We talk about language abilities, so an ability both to express language, so to use our words to express ourselves, um, ask for what we need and want, and then also to be able to hear and understand verbal language um, and answer questions, follow directions. Um, we'll also talk about personality and mood. So an individual's ability to, you know, be in a social setting, make friends, um, be around other people um, and mood. You know, again, this is baseline. We're talking about, you know, for some people, I'm trying to ask history about like decades worth of mood. Um, but as, a, as best we can conceptualize, like was there, was the individual usually generally pretty calm, you know, with the occasional bad day, or did we have a lot of highs and lows, ups and downs, mood swings, kind of very erratic, just trying to get a sense of whatever kind of descriptors we can get from that. So this again is what I would conceptualize as point A. And this is somebody, this is a concept where I am virtually meeting that person. It is built, it is a person who I'm meeting just purely out of the descriptions of the people who know that individual well. And once point A is established, so once I have a good sense of what that individual has been like throughout their lifetime, then it's finally time to start talking about what's going on now. So now that I have an understanding of all the ways in which you were you know, fully individual, uh, independent with all your personal care and you worked three days a week um, in a 
a college kitchen and then you volunteered on Meals of Meals and you had four hours of alone time in your home and you could do these activities, et cetera. Then we're talking about what's going on now. Um, and that's when we go over the exact same points that we just talked about, um, basic function, personal care skills, memory, behavior, language abilities, et cetera. And then that's where in my mind, as I'm having this conversation, we're sort of already comparing and contrasting the differences and sort of noticing the ways in which things are looking different. I find this to be very helpful to be pretty systematic about it too, because you also might identify areas that people are identifying as like something's different, something doesn't look right. Um, but when you go over it in a more granular way, it might kind of highlight to you that an individual, it's mostly like their mood and behavior that looks very different, but functionally they're sort of keeping up with all their usual skills and memory wise, they might still look okay. It's just helpful in terms of drilling down what might be going on. Um, and it also, when you're listening attentively to the history, it might also point you in other directions. Like if people start their sentences with like, you know, everything was going great up until, you know, like using an example of a patient I just saw yesterday, um, everything was October of 2022 is when, you know, it kept going back to the same time point. And so it, it helps you sort of leads you down the path of going further about, tell me more about what might've happened around that time. Um, on, conversely, it could also be that it's something that has just been kind of smoldering under the surface, that people are just starting to gradually notice that these changes have happened over the past two years or so. So again, and just to put it in a different form to go back to this, to this page, if I'm meeting you for the first time here, I really need to know what you were like here. So tell me about when things were going well for you so I can really understand where things might have gotten off the rails. So getting to, now that I've introduced that concept of change and kind of understanding everything that's underpinning change, I find it a lot easier to have a segue into having a conversation about dementia um, and really talking about dementia and a dementia evaluation as sort of a paradigm of change, sort of looking at what um, all the different ways that change plays a role in when people have concerns or raise concerns about dementia. So when we think about um, the criteria for a major neurocognitive disorder, which is also how dementia is, is termed now in the DSM-5. And if you, this is the right-hand side of your screen. Um, so basically in terms of a dementia diagnosis for an individual with intellectual disability, really still ba is based in the same four key criteria that you see here from the DSM-5, that for a, a Diagnosis, you need to have all of these satisfied, that there's evidence of a cognitive decline in performance in one or more of these cognitive domains, and that those deficits interfere with independence in everyday activities. So not only are you having difficulty with your memory and your cognitive function, but it's to the extent that it's now starting to interfere with the way you live your life and that those deficits don't occur exclusively in the context of a delirium and a delirium is a more acute confusion. So if somebody was you know, really terribly ill in the hospital with pneumonia um, and you know, is really very infected, that, that can certainly cause symptoms of an acute confusion because our body is just under so much stress with an infection, um, but that would not be something that would that would certainly not be the time or the place to make a dementia diagnosis, that somebody is looking kind of more wildly confused in the setting of an acute illness. Um, the other criteria for a dementia diagnosis is that those deficits that we're seeing cognitively are not better explained by another mental disorder. So if somebody is, um, you know, has bipolar disorder and is currently manic, then you can't characterize their mania as being symptoms of a dementia. You're saying that they're, 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 level of confusion or disorganization is really primarily due to their active mental health issues. And that it's only once those things are really settled or better understood that we can make a judgment around their memory. But I point these all out to you because I'd say that this, these per, first two components, le, um, number a, or letter A and B, um, really kind of gets down to the storytelling dis discussion around um, an individual with intellectual disability, an individual with Down syndrome, because the real onus is on the, the provider who's doing the assessment to make a dementia diagnosis is to be able to satisfy those criteria with also knowing that the cognitive decline 
is um, compared to their previous baseline so that they actually are showing a decline from their previous level of skills. Um, so these things can't happen in a vacuum. You can't just have somebody show up without taking any more history and say, um, they look confused while they're tying their shoes and they don't know how to set the table. The only way we're able to have an inroads with understanding the significance of that for somebody with an intellectual disability is to really establish that that represents an actual decline from their baseline. And I think this is the key component that really I, I find people get really hung up with if they're not um, kind of well versed in doing these dementia, this type of an assessment for an individual with intellectual disability, they really get stuck with this, this level of, of decision making or thinking around this topic. Um, for those of you who are interested, I can also forward this um, to Marianne as well, but this is really the, um, the, the rest of what I would share in terms of um, a doing a more focused assessment for individuals with intellectual disability and a question about dementia is conceptualized in this um, paper that I helped offer for the National Task Group on Intellectual Disability and Dementia Practices. Um, and it's all consensus guidelines about how to do an assessment. It was written with the goal in mind of being accessible to providers who are out doing primary care and not just within the specialist community, people who are already specialized in adults with intellectual disability, but to provide a framework for people who are gonna be brought this question um, in all across the country or the world where there are not, there's not access to specialty services um, and how to actually have a practical inroads to answering that question in a more meaningful way. So when we think about a framework for assessing change, I'll just share with you kind of, it's certainly I'm not gonna um, pretend this is, it looks straightforward, but I'm just gonna um, talk you through the way I would go through this. Um, so we start out with a, when I see somebody for the first time, we start out very basic with a detailed history of their medical problems, because I also, when we're talking about changes for an individual, it's really important for me to understand what's going on with their health too, because sometimes I'll see people who are saying things look different, but their medical health has just been haywire over the past year or so. Um, and you know they just haven't really been able to like land on their feet hardly at all. So it's just important to really understand what might be going on medically, what else has been happening from a medical standpoint. Um, then a psychiatric history. So understanding what's been going on with somebody's mental health, um, who they see for mental health, if, they, if there is a provider uh, that they follow with, is there a counselor, a therapist, have there been any medication changes they've had? And then I start with what I call, as a geriatrician, I call a developmental history. It's definitely not what a developmental pediatrician would, would document as a developmental history, but for me, it's really about getting the story started for an individual. Where did you come up in life? Um, what, what anything notable around, you know, early childhood, birth, early development, um, and then also kind of it's a way of understanding literally where the individual like grew up and lived as a child and into adulthood, and then when the transition might have happened from adulthood into any other type of non-family living situation, if that's still the case. Then we'll talk about baseline abilities and characteristics. This is really kind of the point A discussion that we talked about. We'll go into some details to understand, you know, what, what things were you able to do well throughout lifetime. And then current abilities and characteristics. What is the individual? What are we noticing now and what are they struggling with? So to put sort of a storytelling language on it, how and where did your story begin? Who were you and who are you now? What are the things that are, are you dealing with now and how do we contrast those um, to what things you were able to do well throughout your lifetime? From there then, um, there's an opportunity when I'm taking that history to give some reflections or clarifying questions, make some observations about timeline. Like I'm noticing you're talking a lot about spring of 2021. Can you tell me more about that? Or, you know, it really helps to have the observers, the people who are giving, helping give information you know, to be able to put some uh, some finer points on what might have happened around that time. Oh, well, you know, um, that's when there was, you know, a loss of a significant housemaid or a real treasured uh, group home manager moved on to a different position, something like that. It can really help sort of refine your understanding of the significance of certain timelines. I then do a function specific review of systems. So really talking about some of the most high yield um, symptoms that we might be looking for. So vision issues, hearing, um, seizure history, 
what's their weight? Um, are, do they have a decent appetite? Have they been losing weight, gaining weight? Do they have any swallowing difficulties? What's their sleep pattern like? Have they become incontinent or is their incontinence worsening? Walking, um, pain, head injury history. So we'll go into all that. Then we talk a while about medications. And so for some people, it's a quicker conversation. For others, it is a really complicated um, piece, just probably to those of you on the call, it's not hard to imagine that medications can be a complicated discussion. One of the things that's most common when we grow older is that we just, we accumulate, we accumulate um, specialists, we accumulate, and the, with those specialists are, we accumulate prescribers and then we accumulate medications. So it's important to spend some time with those medication lists to understand whether or not there's been any new additions, changes, whether or not there's some medications that have side effects that are best avoided or whether or not the risks of those medications might outweigh the benefits, if any of those are really sedating or long acting or might be kind of working in a stacking way with the other medications that they interact with, um, especially when we're talking about questions related to like cognition and sort of looking kind of out of it. Is there any other way in which medications are playing a role in that? And then from there, um, when I'm meeting somebody for the first time, I'll provide sort of my preliminary thoughts and impressions. I'll share with them what I sort of say is like my index of suspicion and my level of worry. Um, so that's what I'm basically saying there is that usually in a first time assessment, it is not appropriate um, to arrive at a definitive diagnosis of a dementia say um, that, you know, all of the goal is usually to be looking for um, any other coexisting conditions or other things that could be contributing to the symptoms that we're discussing. Um, so I'll usually say at the end of sort of that history, when we're talking about point A and point B, boy, I'm really worried about the story you just told me because, you know, this is somebody who you, you painted a really rich picture of somebody who was quite functional, very independent, tons of skills, tons of abilities, hobbies, travel. Um, and now you're describing somebody who is, it's not subtle, the differences you're describing, there's something that's starkly different. So I will mirror that back to them, or I'll say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying. There's some things that it sounds like we need to keep an eye on, um, you know, et cetera. I'll give sort of a, a sense of just how concerned or worried I am. And again, it's, it's really not a diagnostic statement, but it's just me at least being able to sort of share the way I'm processing that story. From there, we'll do a physical and a cognitive exam. Um, and then I'll come up with some additional information that might be needed. So a lot of times there's some additional, um, sometimes there's records that are important to go out and get um, that things that already exist that would be helpful for me to take a look at, or I'll make some, I'll make a bunch of suggestions about what other things need to be done. Um, and then we're always looking to look for contributing factors of what might be going on for somebody. Um, and always looking to see whether or not we can deflect the needle back towards better or back towards good. So always looking for things that might be treatable, improvable, modifiable. What can we do to help move the needle? Um, the point being that you know, a dementia diagnosis is a diagnosis of exclusion, which means that you have to do due diligence to make sure that you are accumulating a basis of um, evidence that sounds very suggestive of a progressive dementia, while also really excluding other common contributors to what might be happening cognitively for an individual. So those two things must be met, that we hear a story that's very suggestive of how a progressive dementia would show up, but definitely doing our best to make sure that this is not also related to a whole myriad of other things that could make somebody look confused or um, less energetic or less attentive. I show this because this is the, the toolbox that I would use when we were in person. My clinic is now virtual and I do virtual assessments, which has actually been a very, um, it, it was born out of necessity at first. And then now it has become something that I'm permanently doing because it has been still, because the um, assessments are still so history-based, um, I feel like there's still lots of ways for this to be a very high impact and meaningful conversation um, and still being able to do virtual um, memory testing as well. The point being that the memory testing that I do is not a cognitive battery. It's not a, um, a neuropsychological test. It's really a lot of practical um, and flexible enough 
memory testing um, tasks that we can do together. So what I'm showing you here are things like um, looking at those markers and we'll name colors or we'll pull you know, coins out of a jar and we'll, we'll um, be able to identify them. And then if there's skills above and beyond that, we can do math with coins or, um, so it's very practical, but flexible enough so that it's not that the individual, if an individual doesn't have um, a certain skill, there's ways that we can adapt it to see if I can get another simpler answer, or if a person has, an, uh, has ability above and beyond what I'm asking, we can dial up. And then the main thing to know is that um, the individual who's where I'm doing that memory testing is that that really serves as their own template of what their abilities are. So that the most meaningful thing would be that if they had a level of ability that we, we documented in 2021, and then I met with them today and they did not have the same skills they had in 2021, that is actually the most meaningful thing to pay attention to, um, as opposed to having somebody do a standardized battery, especially because many things are not really standardized for um, adults with intellectual disability. And the main thing we always wanna be capturing is that somebody's looking different compared to their own individual baseline. So when we're thinking about other things that could be contributing, when we're seeing somebody with Down syndrome related to memory is common medical conditions that are associated with aging and Down syndrome. And many of these things, as I tell you about them, many of these things are um, can cause symptoms that absolutely, if they're present, can look like confusion or disorientation. So it's very common as we grow older for there to be vision and hearing deficits that we see in adults with Down syndrome or to have an underactive thyroid that needs um, medication to help get back into normal range. Obstructive sleep apnea is incredibly common for adults with Down syndrome, where we just don't get a restful and restorative overnight sleep. No matter how many hours we sleep, we are still as if we're sleep deprived, um, which absolutely can, can, can cause symptoms of confusion, sedation, mental sluggishness. Um, osteoarthritis and osteoporosis can affect the ways our body moves um, and wear and tear on the larger joints can happen at earlier ages. So um, our hips, our knees, um, shoulders, so we can be moving a lot more stiffly. Atlantoaxial instability and cervical spine disease. This is um, two conditions that have to do with the cervical spine, the bones that support um, the, the neck and help protect the spinal cord. The very important spinal cord is coursing through that cervical um, uh, spinal column. So there can be some wear and tear that can happen for adults as they grow older that can impinge on that spinal cord and can cause a whole myriad of changes. Um, and this is something that's often can fly under the radar screen for older adults with Down syndrome. And celiac disease, so an intolerance to and a reaction to gluten and wheat products that can show up in a variety of different ways is more common for adults with Down syndrome and can also show up in more atypical ways. So, you know, irritability or some behavior changes, um, sometimes it can show up as a symptom of, of celiac disease. So important to be aware of these other common conditions that are coursing in the background. Um, and the other, of course, very common condition for adults with Down syndrome is Alzheimer's disease. Um, which we'll talk about again in just a second, but just to say that while that's a common condition that we see more at more risk for people who are growing older with Down syndrome, it's really important that in that same list of common conditions is Alzheimer's disease and this whole laundry list of other medical conditions, many of which can masquerade as symptoms of confusion or disorientation. So it's really important to be aware of this list and make sure that there's really been some active looking into all these other very plausible coexisting conditions. And many times these coexisting conditions might not just be like a light switch that, you know, you fix the thyroid and everything's better, but things are not gonna get better if the thyroid isn't, the, the, the things that are flexible or modifiable by being able to address the other issues um, are not gonna get better on their own unless they're identified and addressed. And so it's just another way of trying to sort of clear out all the other factors that we can actually do something about so that we're really understanding what might be going on for an individual. 
This is a dense slide, but sort of deliberately so. This is from that um, Mayo Clinic article, the, the consensus guidelines, but it's basically showing a table of common contributors to memory changes for people with intellectual disability. So it's really meant to highlight that there's many, many, many additional things that could be causing symptoms of confusion. Um, and it's really important to stay mindful and careful around what we're rushing ahead to characterize as a memory disorder if we're not considering these other factors, especially if there's some plausible symptoms. So again, adults with Down syndrome are at higher risk of developing dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. This is a slide that I have taught from like probably from the beginning of my career in this field. I used to use it as more of a way of being more definitive around prevalence numbers. And it's interestingly, the longer I go in this field, the kind of softer I am around giving any firm percentages, because quite honestly, um, the percentages will be will vary depend on the source that you look at. And you see a whole variety of numbers being quoted about the risk of, of adults with Down syndrome to develop Alzheimer's disease. That's not to say that the risk is not quite real and, and significant, but I think the main thing that I would say is that it definitely is, there is a high risk of adults with Down syndrome grow, um, developing out, dementia due to Alzheimer's disease as they grow older. The risk definitely seems to increase as we approach age 50. Average age of onset um, when it does occur is usually in the early 50s. That's, that's a high risk time there. And then risk will incrementally increase as we grow older. So certainly between the ages of 50 and 60 and then 60 and beyond, our risk is definitely going up. Um, so again, I think what I'm echoing is that um, the risk is high and it's real. Um, there is, it's important though, to make sure that we use that risk as a way of being mindful, but also not as a way of just connecting the dots so that any suggestive symptoms immediately leads to that diagnosis. It just means that we really need to pay attention to what's happening once we're entering those decades and really being mindful if we're noticing some changes to make sure that we are really looking into it rather than saying, oh, you know, I, I'm seeing something different. This must be the, this must be dementia showing up. I, it's, it's supposed to happen around now. It's really about making sure that we are looking carefully and comprehensively at those changes to make sure that we're really taking a close look at whether or not that dementia diagnosis is starting to emerge or if there's any other factors that we need to be paying closer attention to. The risk is specific for adults with Down syndrome in this case because it's a genetic correlation between trisomy 21, 321, which leads to World Down Syndrome Day, March 21st, um, three copies of chromosome 21, which is character which characterizes Down syndrome. Chromosome 21 carries a whole myriad of genes, including a gene that codes for the amyloid precursor protein, which is the protein that is laid down in excess in brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. So there is already kind of a higher sort of machinery present for an excess burden of the, um, the changes that happen that cause the neuropathologic features of Alzheimer's disease in a brain. And then also chromosome 21 also carries a number of genes related to aging in general and how we uh, you know, deal with uh, stresses and processes of aging, which is what contributes to this phenomenon of accelerated aging that we see in adults with Down syndrome as well, which you know, as a geriatrician, you would see an individual, I would see an individual who is in their you know, mid to late 40s or 50s who has medical conditions and a level of function or frailty that might look familiar to somebody who I would see in the typical population who's in their 70s or 80s. So, you know, again, this is one way where, you know, geriatricians really separating themselves from the idea of chronologic age that, oh, you know, I'm a doctor of somebody 65 and older, but it's really about the, the common conditions of aging that you actually would see, you can see it um, younger ages for sure for adults with Down syndrome. Other factors to consider when we're thinking just about the genetic risk for adults with Down syndrome in developing Alzheimer's disease is if there is also a family history of premature Alzheimer's disease in a first degree relative. And that is especially true if there's early onset dementia. What I mean there is that 
and I've seen this only a handful of times so far in the hundreds of patients I've seen, um, would be if there's an individual who has Down syndrome, so has the genetic risk to develop dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, but then also has you know, a mother or father who had early onset dementia that arise in their, it arose in say their 50s or so. So those are two, two genetic risk factors then that's just really tragic for the individual and the family it can be very, very difficult. Um, if there's Alzheimer's disease that has is present in, it's a very common diagnosis, unfortunately. So it is very common for it to be spoken of as being part of somebody's family history. It's still notable, um, but certainly if, if the Alzheimer's disease was present um, mostly as a as an aging phenomenon, so it's you know that a maternal grandmother developed dementia when she was 83, or you know mom is dealing with dementia and she you know it was a late life phenomenon. It's certainly something to pay attention to, um, but it certainly doesn't have that same kind of really intense risk like it would if it were the premature onset dementia. Um, other risk factors for developing dementia, in addition to just the genetic risk from Down syndrome, would be if there's additional cerebral vascular disease. So if the individual also has a history of strokes um, or has significant risk factor for um, strokes or blood vessel disease um, in the brain. The um, karyotype of trisomy 21, so whether or not an individual has mosaic Down syndrome, where only a portion of their cells are affected by three copies of chromosome 21 or if they have full, um, full penetrance uh, trisomy 21 where every cell is affected. Um, the mosaic Down syndrome is um, just has a lower um, risk. It is still a risk, um, but certainly if you have full penetrance of trisomy 21, that is something that carries the same sort of traditional classic risk. Um, adults who've had significant head traumas so certainly if they've had a concussion or any type of head injury, that does increase risk as well when we're talking about dementia risk, the severity of their intellectual disability. And that really just gets to what we would consider sort of cognitive reserve. So an individual's like sort of how strong their brain muscle has been and how much they can kind of sort of withstand when we're starting to um, develop some cognitive changes. And then for women, the um, an earlier age of menopause, which is common for adults with Down syndrome, for women with Down syndrome, um, some of that earlier deficiencies of estrogen can also cause some increased risk as well. I think in the interest of time, I will um, skip over that, but in terms of just taking into effect um, other factors that can contribute, and certainly I think one thing to, to highlight here would be um, other factors related to um, other medical comorbidities. So um, severe psychiatric illness or exposure to some really potent psychiatric medications is important to play, um, that can play a role in how we're doing cognitively and later in life. And then a history of epilepsy and exposure to anti-epileptic medications is also something that's important to take, in, um, take into account. I'm gonna switch over that. So expectation setting is the other, the last concept that I'll share with you. And I say that because it's important to remember that when we are seeing and evaluating, when I'm seeing and evaluating somebody who's experiencing changes, um, it's important not only to try to get to the root cause of what might be causing those changes, but then kind of clearing the decks and coming up with sort of a now what after you've done your assessment and you've been able to drill down on what might be going on, especially if the, if the, the end result is that you feel like it's an accurate um, eventually that you feel like the, a dementia diagnosis is accurate, um, then you know, people are helped by being able to come to that conclusion confidently and to be able to feel like they've gotten an accurate and comprehensive evaluation. But the now what that comes after that diagnosis is a really important and sometimes overlooked or glossed over, um, at least from a medical encounter discussion, because um, so much effort goes into the diagnostics. But then beyond that, especially because unfortunately, say our, our medication options are not so miraculous that so much of the now what of treatment has to do more with like practical guidance and proactive planning and how to come together with supports and what to be looking out for and how to safeguard an individual and think about the future, et cetera. So it really, the expectation setting piece is really so hugely important. It helps anticipate the next chapters that might be coming up setting goals, reality testing plans that some 
they might, you know, well, well, we just figured he'd stay in that apartment forever, or we'd, you know, he'd live at home with us forever, bringing clarity to what was discovered in that assessment so that we can make sure that we're providing good guidance looking forward. And it's, it matters, you know, just in so many different ways, but it really helps empower the individuals, caregivers, family members um, to properly prepare for the future. So particularly when we're talking about a dementia diagnosis, part of the reason it's so important to make sure that we are not prematurely diagnosing it and really feeling like we're confident is because that diagnosis is a diagnosis that really changes the trajectory of the entire future for the individual. Um, it really means that there's going to be something that we expect to sort of be dynamically and permanently changing for an individual's future in terms of their, their level of support and how much assistance they'll need. Um, so nobody is really helped by prematurely giving that diagnosis. Um, and certainly once we feel confident about it, then there's really important time to be talking about what that means. It really matters to the person who's sitting across the table from me. For example, like there was a shared living provider of an individual who I diagnosed with dementia, who she had been caring for this um, uh, individual in her home for, I think, 20 years, and it had become part of her family, but her family also consisted of her own four young kids under the age of 12. And so just what had worked really well as a shared living, a really successful shared living setting was really prompting her to think as a mom and a caregiver and a mother to these children, like, what can my family handle? And how do we think forward about what what we can do from here with this information. So it's all part of the same continuum. We want to make sure that we're working on evaluating change, gathering data, understanding what might be going on, taking a closer look at what's going on, helping make a plan, assessing the impact of that plan, and then having a conversation about setting expectations moving forward. I think the main thing that, again, to the variety of learners that are on this call um, in every different way that you um, might work with and serve adults with Down syndrome, we all, I, the important thing to, to emphasize is that a lot of the things that I talked about today, particularly around history and um, you know, understanding baseline and being observers is that we all can be astute observers of change. It's not that when I, I, I'm, I can take a, I'm skilled at taking a history and I want to draw out certain information from individuals that I see, but there's, there's no magic to being able to sort of think about what you're observing, think about baseline and having a framework, particularly because these conversations and this thought process is not quick and easy and often doesn't lend itself at all to like a typical 15 minute encounter with a provider if you have questions. And so I think a lot of this work is something that I want the, the, everybody on the call and the people that you serve to kind of help empower people to say, if they're seeing something that's looking different, to also spend some time thinking about changes, thinking about baseline, kind of gathering some information so that you yourselves can also start to put together some of the, um, some of the missing pieces or trying to sort of at least come up with some patterns or observations about what it is specifically that you're noticing that's looking different. Caregivers are often the best storytellers with this. It's really just being able to give, to prompt that individual to help give the information that they already know or the things that they've been observing. I know for myself, it's always helpful to use that very systematic approach. So just sort of baseline characteristics and then thinking about current. And a storytelling and narrative also helps us build connections and deep, deepens our understanding of problems. That to me makes this work fun, that being able to take this um, history and, and use storytelling as a, as a way of really kind of trying to go deep and understand an individual quickly is able to then help inform in a more meaningful way um, some of the things that we might be um, talking about or making recommendations for for the future. So that brings us to the end. I know I went over time, um, but I really wanted to make sure that I um, was able to just finish and kind of finish out those, those uh, ending pieces for you. I will hold back now and see if there's any questions. I see some things accumulating. So let me there, know how I can. There um, are. Thanks, Julie. I'm trying to kind of just condense them in the, in the respect for your time. Um, just real quick, can you speak to UTIs as possibly being another uh, oh, 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'd say um, that is that is probably an example going back to what we were talking about when we see changes that happen suddenly. So 
um, sudden changes or something where somebody looks different, um, but it feels like something looked different overnight. That usually calls out kind of a drop down menu of other things that happen kind of um, quickly. So very commonly to think about infections, other sources of infection. UTI is certainly one of the most common things, particularly in the sort of older patient population. There's just additional risk factors to make that um, possible. And that's an important thing to highlight that, you know, um, changes that happen quickly definitely should prompt a should the first phone call should not be to get a memory evaluation, but just to make sure that somebody is being checked out medically. Um, sudden changes are things that feel like they've happened in a relatively short period of time. Cover your bases with getting a, a routine checkup, a little bit of blood work, a urine sample, anything else that's based on those symptoms to make sure that there's, because that's an easily treatable and reversible situation um, that's important to respond to. Perfect. Thank you. Can you quickly speak to the fear of um, the possible trigger triggering factors of being put under general anesthesia frequently, for instance, like for dental appointments, those kinds of things? So I'm assuming that what you mean might be in terms of how that relates to cognitive health. Um, yes. Yeah. So I think um, that's a great question. I don't have off the top of my head, like uh, numbers or percentages to share. It would be something I'd have to look up, but it definitely is something that, especially general anesthesia, um, there is some risk factor associated with that, particularly if we're in a vulnerable class of, of individuals. So somebody who we're, is growing older, or we have some worries already about cognitive health or memory, um, risks versus benefits of a general anesthesia, you know, a dose of general anesthesia is something that's important to consider. Um, especially, you know, like you said, maybe a planned medical procedure, but somebody who needs maybe more or a planned dental procedure, but if somebody who's going to have maybe more prolonged, if they have a, a longer, a lengthier surgery, um, you know, it, that definitely is a vulnerable window for somebody, um, cognitively in terms of, of just bouncing back from that. Thank you. Um, real quickly, what time would you say would be good to start a baseline? Um... So a couple of different answers. So I think um, the there's Down syndrome guidelines that are out that are really, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to scroll back. There's um, some Down syndrome uh, or care of adults with Down syndrome guidelines that have come out recently and were updated. And I'm trying to remember if they said 35 or 40. Um, but the recommendation is usually a baseline assessment at 40 would be the typical guidance that I would say. The one thing that's important to emphasize there is that um, well, number one, trying to get, make sure that if you're, if you're actually formally seeking out a baseline assessment that you are, you know, if you have a resource of somebody to go to who would be able to actually deliver that for you. Like I've had somebody come, I've had people come and see me saying, we're here for a baseline assessment. Great, I know what you're talking about, let's do it. Um, but it's not something, unfortunately, that you're able to just go to any provider and say, that's what we're here for. One thing that's important, um, not only to do, so to, the goal is to do some sort of assessment of memory ability um, at 40 so that we'd be able to actually track some changes throughout lifetime and have some basis. I'd also say that the framework of what we just talked about, even just a narrative baseline, so it might not be something that's, it's not performed by a physician, but at least in terms of record keeping, I like to think of baseline also as a storytelling, especially as something that's going to live on if you're if you're documenting something when somebody's 35 or 40, um, how sort of rich and important that is for somebody who might pick it up when that individual is 60 as a way of understanding what that individual has been able to do well throughout their lifetime. The other thing I like to, to think about, especially for people who serve adults who are younger, is thinking about sometimes baseline is kind of happening in all different ways. And there's some really fun and positive ways to think about documenting some aspects of baseline through like scrapbooking or video, like ways of sort of cobbling together accomplishments. Um, you know, there used to be uh, the individual that I, um, uh, one individual, the, the young, the man who I showed those pictures of throughout lifetime, that was a, an actual patient who I was involved with early into my training named Jim who he and his mother taught me quite a bit early on, 
but I remember there was a picture over his bed um, and I met him when he had mid-stage dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, but there was a picture of his bed in his group home of him diving, like arcing diving into a swimming pool. And I just like that alone over his bed when you see him underneath there, like lying there in bed like midday and he wasn't feeling well and just seeing this amazing sort of baseline picture hanging over him. Um, so I, I bring that up just to say that there's lots of different ways to also capture baseline information that's actually quite meaningful and practical um, when we're trying to think about ways in which we could leave some breadcrumbs for the future to understand what's different and what's not. Wonderful. Um, there are several other questions, but in the interest of time and respecting your time and everyone else's on here, are, are you okay if I send you some of those? And maybe yeah. okay, that would be great. And I wanted to let everybody know there's questions about the documents from NTG that will get you. Um, the end of life NDSS publication is not quite out yet, I believe, right? But I can send you the links to the other ones to download those. Um, and we'll send you the slide deck and also a recorded video. So I think we're good in that respect. Um, one last quick question is, are you able to see anybody outside of Massachusetts? <laughs> no, I, so I should share that, you know, and I think this, this comes up very, um, logically, obviously, right. but no, so my, I am lucky enough to be contracted with the state of Massachusetts that, um, helps protect my time so I can do these assessments. Um, it's a it's a system that works well, practically speaking too, because I'd say as somebody who um, also started my career in academic medicine and trying to do these types of assessments in, a, in all the natural constraints of a like a billing system model, like this type of a framework is really important to be able to have some sort of work around where you're able to spend the amount of time that an individual needs. So it's a long way of me saying that, no, I'm exclusive to the state of Massachusetts in terms of serving adults with um, intellectual disability who are served by DDS. Um, but that's why I also really welcome and enjoy speaking to other um, states and other um, locations to just sort of highlight some other ways that we can, um, you know, outside of having a medical specialist, also other things that we can be doing proactively. And there's some, um, I, I there's some there's some really good providers in your state doing there's some good researchers and stuff but um yeah everybody is kind of coming up with their own um or the people who are who are doing this work there's all different unique ways that people are trying to um to stay sustainable in a, in a, a field that just is very um time intensive and necessary right absolutely all right well, thank you so much for that. We greatly appreciate it. It's been very informative. We probably could have gone on for three hours. <laughs> I, I know right. we could. Absolutely. <laughs> I know we could. Um, but thanks everyone for your attention. Thank Happy you. Down Syndrome Day. Thank you for all the great work you're doing as colleagues on the other coast. And uh, I look forward to looking at your questions and any feedback you might have. I welcome it. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Happy World Down Syndrome Day. Take care. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.